Training and certification are highly recommended for all individuals working with pressurized fluid. This could include a basic hydraulics or pneumatics training course, or could include actual certification, such as our hydraulic specialist or mobile hydraulic mechanic, just as examples. Many employers and businesses offer on-the-job training as well. And it's important just to be trained and to be aware of all of the potentials that exist and understand the equipment that you're working on or designing. Uh, you can check out the IFPS website for all of the available certifications that are offered, and that's at www.ifps.org forward slash certifications dash offered. Each worker has the obligation to work safely and to correct any unsafe acts or practices and or conditions that are in place for protection of the worker and of others. So if this is you, you recognize something that's wrong, you have the obligation to raise that as a concern and help correct the issue to not only protect yourself, but to also protect others. It's extremely important to understand how each task is to be performed and how to perform that in a safe manner. If instructions for daily operation are not clear, get clarification before beginning the work. It's necessary to comply with all rules and requirements established by a particular manufacturer and or job site where the work is being performed. Some examples are to use lifting devices for heavy or awkward objects. This is often for the use of a jib crane or an overhead crane, as is shown in the pictures on the screen. In many instances, when lifting loads, this is applicable to an item that's equal to or exceeding 40 pounds. Always check with the employer or the site location for specific rules and guidelines. The 40 pounds is kind of a general guideline. You can see places where it's 50, other places it's 40. But the importance here is to provide safe operation for you as an employee and as human where you're perhaps lifting something, you don't want to throw your back out or cause undue injury due to that unsafe practice. It's important also to follow manufacturer's guidelines during startup. Instructions can range from very simple to very complex, depending upon the complexity and the operation or the function of the system. Here's shown in a industrial application where a control panel is set with all sorts of functionality, different controls, different buttons. And in this case, the individual is looking at how to go through and actually operate the equipment safely. Learn how to operate the emergency stop before starting. In many cases, the emergency stop is an important part to know how to use it in the event of the emergency. This is going to bring the system or the machine to a stop condition in the event of an emergency, and it's going to allow that to occur. So it's important to know how that interacts and how to operate that and also where they're located. In some instances, machines may have more than one depending on the size and the complexity of the machine. In industrial applications, there may be multiple e-stops located at different locations around a shop floor to allow personnel that are in the area, if they notice something going wrong, that they can shut the machine down safely and access that emergency stop versus having to maybe work the entire way across the plant to get to a single emergency stop, they can have those strategically placed so that they're readily accessible. Some may be present in a normal operating panel or a human machine interface, which is often referred to as an HMI, which is what's shown here in the graphics, while others may be remote mounted on say a pillar or a post within the building that a personnel or bystander that's working in the area would be able to access that. So it's important to know where they're at, how they're operated within the machine operation, 
and then also how they interact. In some cases, there may be special sequences that have to go through in order to bring the machine back online after the emergency situation has been addressed. Following proper startup procedures is also very important. You want to refer to both the manufacturer, the employer, and local regulations for proper procedures. A walk around or inspection is often required before startup of a machine. Following the walk around or inspection, oftentimes a horn or alarm is used to then notify personnel to the start of the machine. That horn and alarm should be sounded prior to starting the machine, followed by a short pause so that the operator can listen for anyone that would be within the area that may be saying, hey, I'm in the area, don't start. It allows for that communication with individuals within the area to be aware that a startup is going to occur. On an assembly line, this may be an alarm that's gonna beep several times before the assembly line actually is started, or it may be in a mobile application before you start a piece of construction equipment. So it's applicable to both industrial and mobile applications. In industrial settings, that alarm may be built into the PLC for control and activation and can be built into the HMI where your main starting panel is. In mobile equipment, a lot of times sounding that horn is part of the common daily startup procedure. So if you start the machine several times during the day, each time that you start, that procedure is going to call out activation of the horn, again, to notify personnel that you're going to start the machine. Use personal protective equipment, also known as PPE. PPE can include a lot of items. This can include face shields or safety goggles, earplugs or earmuffs, and can include safety shoes ranging from steel toe to metatarsal guards, and then specific clothing that is suitable for the environment. This may be as simple as a reflective vest or may include a fire resistant or arc flash suit dependent upon the job and the location and where you're working. Hard hats may also be required depending on the job and the location. It's important to wear gloves when handling sharp objects, but also when handling hot materials and to protect your hands against hot surfaces. So if you're working on an engine, it's important to have gloves. You may be around hot components and you don't want to burn the skin. It's also important to recognize that the PPE may be specific to different applications. In this case, a glove is not always the same use for, I'll say, exposure to chemicals versus gloves that are protecting you against hot surfaces. It's important to recognize what those requirements are and make sure that you're following those. Those specific PPE requirements are often determined by both local regulation and employer-specific guidelines. 